I'm really, really pleased to be introducing this individual to you today. He's been here all day, so you may have already met him. Some of you won't be surprised. Uh, this is Brent Ryan. Uh, he's sitting right here in the front. He'll come up here in just a second. He is the founder and CEO of Ryan, which is a tax services firm, uh, global-based tax services firm, and over 900 employees. And part of the story that makes this so interesting in this context, well, part of it's entrepreneurial context and part of it's great place to work context. So first, he was employed at one of the largest uh, firms prior to you know, top four, the big four, right, accounting firms, and just walked away in, in his 20s and said, this isn't working. <laughs> I need to do something else. I have an idea. And, and so that's exciting in the entrepreneurial sense and often creates a founder with a real vision. And, uh, and so the growth that he's been able to experience has been you know, astronomical. And what it means for us in a great place to work sense is that he's been working really hard to get <laughs> onto the list for the first time this year. So congratulations. <laughs> and, and we're bringing him to the stage today to talk about his journey and to talk about, you know, was it 05 when you started uh, yes, doing the trust 05. index? So the journey's been a long one. I know many of you have experienced that. We've heard that several times today, that someone had a vision or employee-driven uh, desire to make a change. It takes several years. So that's what he's here to talk to us about. And with no further ado, come on up. Welcome him, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here with you this afternoon, uh, especially to be among such a prestigious group of companies. Uh, let me tell you, there were many times that I thought that uh, we might never be here. Um, and this has been for us uh, a remarkable journey. Uh, it's been a remarkable journey in the sense of what we've accomplished as a company. But it's been an even more remarkable journey in the sense of what it's done for our leadership team and our people in terms of simply an awakening. And I want to share that story with you this afternoon. Uh, I've got about three hours worth of material, so I'll try to condense it into the time allotted. But I think you'll find it an, an interesting and compelling story. Uh, I think from the discussion that I've heard today, there are many similarities uh, with some of your companies, although I think you might find that we would win an award if there were such an award for the come from behind company. Uh, and you'll see that when we get into the details. Uh, but let me give you just a little bit of background about what we do. Um, you know, I've got one of the greatest jobs in the whole world. You know what I do for a living? Well, Sarah told you it's tax services and that all sounds fancy and good, but you know what I really do? I take money away from the government. <laughs> and I take lots of money away from the government. In fact, in a given year, our firm will recover either taking it directly back from taxing authorities, be it international, federal, local, about a billion and a half dollars. This year, we're on track to raise that to two billion dollars a year. And you know what we do with that? What our purpose in life is? It's to create great value and give it back to companies like yours so you can do great things with it. Um, frankly, I get to wear the white hat almost all of the time, and that's incredibly rewarding. Uh, but we are a, a, almost 1,000 folks today in 46 global locations. Uh, we've got, we're the largest indirect tax practice in the United States. Uh, we're the largest transaction tax practice in the world. We're the largest tax services firm in the world that's not an accounting firm. And if you add the accounting firms into the mix, we're number seven. We've done that in 22 years. Uh, I left uh, the firm that I was practicing with in 1991. I had a partner, by the way. Um, we weren't a great place to work back then, and after three years, he decided that he'd had enough of me, and he quit <laughs> and went into retirement because I was working him too hard. Uh, big mistake on his part, but I learned a few lessons as part <laughs> of that. But in that period of time, you know, we've gone from two people to the, uh, what I believe is the most successful firm in our space. And you know, one of the problems with this list uh, is that it points out that even great companies, and I think in 2005, I think we were a great company. Uh, we were one of the very best at what we do as a profession. Nobody did it better. We took a multidisciplinary approach and created a model that the world had never seen before, uh, and we've been rewarded for it. Trouble is, when you have that kind of success, it can mask all sorts of other problems. 
you know, it can hide all sorts of deficiencies. You know, if you're highly profitable, if you're growing quick, you can cover up a lot. We did. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about what happened to us. Uh, in 2005, Delta Emerson, then our chief human resources officer, and she's right up here uh, in front with me, and I often refer uh, to her uh, or about her as the soul of our company. If I'm the brains, Delta's the soul, and don't anybody up here say anything about that. Um, <laughs> but, but she had been pushing me uh, for a number of years that, look, we, you, we, we're great, we're successful, let's benchmark ourselves against the true leaders. Let, let's see if we can qualify. Um, I gotta tell you, it was a humbling experience. Um, we weren't a great company uh, as far as our employees were concerned. Um, in fact, I'll tell you, I have no idea where we landed on this list, but I'm telling you, I'm just very glad that we're on this list. And we've created and harvested an incredible amount of value getting on the list, and we look forward to continuing to do that. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the company. You know, over this uh, eight-year odyssey, I discovered that the company really, for better or for worse, for good or for bad, had a culture that was very much based on my personality. I mean, let's face it, when I was the only person there, I was writing the rules. And unlike some of your companies that are very forward thinking, we love rules. We like to write lots of them. <laughs> in fact, our rules got set, got so big that we couldn't fit it on a book, we had to put it on the internet. <laughs> you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up in West Texas, a little town called Big Spring, and I figured out that I was among my peer group, I was never the brightest person in the room, but I was always the hardest working. And this created a work ethic for me that has served me very well. What I learned from it was that if, if, just, if I wasn't the, the, the smartest, if I didn't have the, the most charming personality and the best of looks, and ladies be quiet, um, <laughs> I could just outwork the competition, and I did that. Um, you know, I remember growing up, one of the, one of the most impactful things that I ever did was I built fence out on a ranch where we grew up. And I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, that made a college boy out of me in no time flat. <laughs> I've decided very quickly that was too hard to make a living. I didn't want to do that anymore. But from that experience, uh, I came away with a work culture, with, with, a, with a work ethic that, you know, it's been very beneficial. And I believed in you got ahead through hard work. You know, you, you put the yoke on, and you just worked until you dropped, and that's how you did things. And that was part of the culture that we built at Ryan. We were a hard-working group of people. We charged through anything. We made things happen. We were successful because of it. You know, another personality uh, quirk, uh, my wife might say disorder, uh, is I hate to lose. It feels bad. I don't like it. Uh, and so we built this company in a way that when we were challenging governments all over this world, we won. We fought harder, we outmaneuvered them, we, 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 we outnegotiated them, and we won. Um, so when I got that first Great Places to Work rejection letter, <laughs> I'll tell you, it angered the hell out of me. You know, I, 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 I was just like, you know, all right, forget that. We're not doing that anymore. That's a waste of time. I mean, all those people are talking about free pizza on Friday and massages. What has that got to do with taking money away from the government? I mean, what has that got to do with creating value for our clients? That's something, quite frankly, and I know I might get tomatoes at this point, but that's what a bunch of namby-pamby HR people are throwing at us. I'm not interested. Delta talked me off the ledge. She said, well, you know what? We did learn a lot. You know, because the metrics that, is, that are produced by this process are very detailed, they're very specific, they're actionable. So we were able to take that after I calmed down, you know, after I took a deep breath, and I said, all right, fine. Let's get into this. And so we did. We went through the number crunching. Uh, we looked at all the data. We realized that um, we had a lot of work to do. But... We, 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 we began to understand for the first time that this was not about simply applying for a list, getting your name in a book, maybe getting a trophy for the trophy case, and moving on. And I gotta, I gotta tell you, that's what I thought this was. In the beginning, I thought this was simply one of those things you do, you know, check the box, going about your business. Uh, 
in 2005, I could not have imagined how transformational this process has been for our company. We are not the same company we were in 2005. Um, you know, it's remarkable that me, a guy who designed a workplace where we required our people to work an average of 55 hours every week, that was the deal. And if you didn't want to do that, you got out. Um, I designed that. So me talking about great, great places to work, me talking about workplace flexibility, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot like Hugo Chavez talking about human rights. <laughs> okay? But I knew that if we were going to do this, it was going to be about business. I'll tell you, I'm a rabid capitalist. I didn't, I didn't care about free pizza on Friday. I wanted to have enough money in the bank where I could buy all the pizza that I could haul away in trucks. I didn't care. I wanted to design something that worked from a business perspective. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? I had no clue how to do that. Um, you know, but as a result of this process, as a result of this competition, what ultimately happened, and I'm going to tell you this story in some detail, um, what happened is we ended up ultimately ripping the entire roots of our culture out. We tore it out by the roots and started over. Uh, and it was a very difficult, painful process. But I want to show you how we did it, how our culture evolved over that time, because I think it's instructive. Uh, you know, I think I could be the poster child for great places to work, because if you can transform a company like Ryan, let me tell you, you can transform anybody. Let's examine some of the metrics. This is what I got in 2005. We knew we had trouble before this. We were watching the exit interviews, and that awful B word kept coming up. You know the one that y'all have talked about some today? Work-life balance. I hate that term. I despise it. Okay, because what that meant to me was code for work less. <laughs> Do less. I believe that. I mean, I'm a product of public accounting. I thought that the more hours you worked, the more money you made, and so therefore, you know, to the extreme, you worked until you dropped and you, 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 you died early, but you were rich, okay? <laughs> I, I thought that was a great way to do things. Um, I realized that what I had done, quite innocently, was that I had created a sweatshop. Um, now, you know how I justified it? Do you all know this, that rationalization is a powerful <laughs> tool, isn't it? It is a powerful tool, because if you work at it hard enough, you can explain away almost anything. So here's how I did it. Our turnover was not good, but I did a lot of research, and I found out that the turnover in the financial services industry sector was about 27%. So I went to our guys and I said, well, hey, our total turnover is about 23%, so we're, we're kicking butt, right? We're ahead of everybody else. Um, we got some pretty embarrassing results. 62%, 56% of our people said Ryan was a healthy place to work. Fifty-six said, yeah, okay, and then um, 42%. See, I was, I was serious about that B word, wasn't I? <laughs> now, I will tell you, you'll, you'll hear me talk about this a lot. We don't talk about work-life balance at Ryan. We talk about work-life success, and that's part of what we've evolved to because I believe that our job uh, is to create an environment where people can do their best, not just at work, but in their lives. And I think that if, if we're successful, the people that work with us, and I, I, I admire the CEO earlier today that said, you know, it's my job to serve the organization. And I feel that way. When somebody comes into my office and they need help, I'll shine their shoes if necessary because they are, they are the company. They're the value. Uh, they're the ones that are out there every day making it happen. But I'll tell you, it took a long time for me to come to that realization. Uh, and it was this process that helped do that. So when I saw this, I'm like, wow. 
Managers avoid playing favorites, 56%. People look forward to coming to work here, 58%. Wonder what the rest of them thought. <laughs> Wonder what that was on their mind. Uh, this is a fun place to work. I feel good about the way we contribute to the community. Well, apparently not. Boy, that's scary. When you're the CEO of a company that you founded, that you poured your life's work into, and you get this kind of a grade from your people, it's a kick in the butt, right? And it took that, frankly, to wake us up. So 67% 2005, this is where we started. So you, you understand what I mean by the come from behind firm, the comeback kid, because we really started at a very, very low place. But you know, we're bean counters by nature. And after we shrugged off the bruised ego, after we put our pride in check, we said, you know, we can work on this. We, we understand it. So we started the process. We started looking at two areas that we knew immediately that we could impact because we were getting data from the exit interviews. We were talking to people as they were leaving, and they're saying, you know, you just can't have a life here. And, you know, we, we don't have, um, you know, any charge over our lives. So we focused on that. Another one was community outreach. You know, individually, we were generous people. I mean, we were fortunate. We were successful. We were making a lot of money. Uh, and individually, you know, we were um, generous. But we had no focus, no strategy, no, no, no common approach, really nothing. Training. You know, we did a great job training tax technical. So if you wanted somebody that could cite the code forwards, backwards, and sideways, <laughs> explain in depth the regulations three versions ago, we were great at that. But you know, we, it never even occurred to us until we got these results that maybe it would be a good idea to turn that same approach onto interpersonal skills and professional development and all of the other things that make people successful leaders and well-rounded people. Uh, communication. Well, this is an easy topic. There really was none. I mean, we were all there together 55 hours a week. We didn't have time to communicate. But we learned that we could do a lot just by having town hall meetings. And so we've incorporated that now into our process. I travel all over the world doing town hall meetings. We're working on technological solutions to, to, to do even more. Uh, we had a session in our annual meeting last year where we basically got everybody in a room, 900 some odd people, and we spent two hours on the topic of what could we change at Ryan to make this a career for life. And wow, what a bunch of great uh, operational uh, information we got from that session. Benefits. Well, we had basic benefits, but we've done some really creative things in the benefits area. We have sabbaticals now. Let me tell you, Delta will attest that it took a long time to get me to buy off on that. I'll come back and tell you more why I did it. Um, maternity leave, we've got one of the most generous benefit packages in our space. Same with paternity leave. Uh, we've got a very unique military benefit. Um, we make up the differential for our people in the military service from what the government pays them to what they make with us for as long as they're in service. And most people, I tell that, and they're, they're, they can't believe it. Um, I won a Patriot Award from the uh, National Guard and Reserve as a result of putting that policy in place. And, you know, I look at the cost of that policy, it's chump change compared to what it means for our organization culturally. Um, the one military benefit that I did try to implement that HR shot down was the sniper benefit because we had one kid who was a sniper in Af Afghanistan, and I wanted to put an incentive together where we could get $100 per confirmed kill. But... Uh, <laughs> They said, no, Brent, that's over the top. You can't do that. So when I tell you I can think outside the box, I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, we embraced wellness because, you know, one of the things that we recognize is that our job is tough. It's a grueling uh, profession, and I believe you've got to be fit. I believe you've got to be, you know, at the top of your game to be your most productive. And so we've poured a lot of time and effort into wellness. Um, we do challenges. But we have a biometric screening process where we, we go and we report back health issues for our people. We encourage them to work out. We have a, a fitness uh, club membership that we pay for our people. So we've done a lot in that area. 
Uh, camaraderie, uh, this was an area that we ranked very low in, and we spent a lot of time working here. Uh, we have allowances where each team can take their people out and celebrate important events, birthdays, uh, big wins within the company. Um, we, we celebrate a lot of things. Our uh, 20th anniversary, we took the entire organization to Las Vegas and uh, spent the whole weekend there partying together and having a good time. Uh, we did that in, in our 15th year in Orlando. But some of these things, and you'll see in a minute the, the change in the scores, but some of these things we really hit head on. One was community outreach. We hit this head on. Uh, the first thing we did is we formed a new 501c3 called Ryan Foundation. And we got our people to pledge a percentage of their earnings into the foundation. And my partners pledged 5% of the profits uh, that are distributed annually into the foundation. And so we've gone from giving a little uh, at the company level to giving a significant amount. And we've adopted four uh, major charities uh, as part of that. Uh, and we've got our people involved. Every office has the ability to have their own committee. Uh, and, and we look at this as something that's critically important. We rally around it. We, we use it for team building. You know, and, and, and we are successful. And we are fortunate. And we are blessed. And this is a way for us to give back. But it's an also a way to give back so that all of our people know how we're giving back. They see what we're doing. Uh, and they embrace it. Uh, and you'll see in a minute the difference it made. The other thing, the more troubling thing, was the hours culture. You know, and I sat through this process, and I, it was so difficult for me to mentally shift away from, I want to see your hours, I want to see how much you're billing, I want to know what your realization is, because that translates into money for us. Um, and it took a long time, because we wore hours as a badge of, of uh, honor. Um, people would go around and say, yeah, I was number 10 in the company last year for charged hours. I remember my, early in my career, I charged 23 and a half 2,350 hours in a single uh, busy season, a single year, and I was rewarded for that. Uh, I don't know how productive all those hours were because I was about a zombie at the end, but I did it. Uh, and we had to shift away from that culture. Um, but we didn't really know how to do it. Um, it was, a, it was a, a, an awakening as we went through the process. I mean, we were working hard, but not smart. Uh, and Delta Emerson... She kept coming to me relentlessly with turnover data, with negative data from the exit interviews. And so I'm like, OK, if, if this will placate you, we will put a team <laughs> together. We will study this problem. But in the meantime, get back to work. <laughs> um, it's instructive that I finally agreed to have our inaugural Work-Life Success Committee meeting on Texas OU Weekend. <laughs> So if you wanted to talk about work-life balance, you get your butt in the office on Saturday during the OU weekend, and we'll talk about it. Obviously, we had a long way yet to go. Um, but as we went through this process, I had an epiphany. Now, I didn't mention earlier in the presentation, but over a nine-year period, my wife and I have five daughters. OK? There's three of them right there at the Hockaday Benefit that we sponsored. That's their school. One day, when I've got all this noise in my ears from Miss Emerson and other people, it, it, it hit me like a bolt of lightning that everything they were asking me to do, everything they were suggesting as a change in our culture, I had already done. Because you see, when you're the CEO, nobody's going to call you to account for not following the rules. So if I had to take Victoria, the little one, to dictation dads at 9 o'clock on a Friday, I did that. I didn't ask permission. I ignored the rule that I was supposed to have my butt in my chair at 8.30. And what I had done, you know, without really paying attention to it, is I had created the new culture. Because what I was doing is I was following the model of putting the big rocks in first, and you've heard this analogy before, and putting the little ones in after. I worked when I needed to work. So if I had something for the girls, I took that time off. If I had to go camping on a weekend, I didn't work that weekend. I was home every night to, to have dinner with them and tuck them in bed, and then I spent two or three hours on email when everybody else was asleep. So I had already done this. And slowly but surely, I began to realize, wait a minute. 
if it's successful for me, and let's face it, I had one of the biggest books of business in the company. I was arguably one of the most productive people in the company. So if it worked for me, why couldn't it work for everybody else? That's when I began to change. That's when I began to realize that maybe I'm thinking about this wrong. Maybe the answer is that if everybody had the flexibility to work like I worked, they could have the same level of productivity that I had. Now, a lot of my partners totally disagreed with that. They thought I was nuts. But I didn't want to do this halfway. I can't pinpoint exactly the day that I made the decision, but I made the decision that we weren't going to do pizza on Friday. We weren't going to have a flexibility program. We weren't going to do telecommuting. We weren't going to do any of that stuff. We were going to do a 180 degree reversal of course in our culture. Um, our tagline is that we, are, we create innovative solutions to taxing problems. So our view was if we're innovative and creating, creative in the tax space, why can't we be that same way when it comes to work environment, work culture? benefits, all the things that matter to our people. Because you see, somewhere along the way, I realized that you cannot be the leading global brand in tax, which is the, our aspirational goal, without being a great place to work. They're mutually exclusive. You can't do it. Now, it took me a long time to realize that. But once we made that decision, we went truly radical. Uh, the first thing we did is we came up with a concept called My Ryan. Uh, and we told everybody, look, henceforth, uh, we're going to change the game. And how this came about is while all this was going on, it was percolating. You know, we were having these meetings. We were struggling with what are we going to do. I had one of our very best young, talented females come to me. And she sat down in my office and she said, you know, I want to tell you, I love this company. Uh, it's, the work is challenging. Uh, I, I, I love my team, you know, I, I'm doing great here, uh, and I want to give you my resignation letter. And I mean, I literally nearly fell out of my chair, and I'm like, whoa, time out. What do you mean? You just said you, you love it here. You just said you, you liked your team. And she said, this culture will not permit me to start a family. I can't do it. I can't have success outside of work in this culture. So that's when we decided to take that 180-degree turn. And what my Ryan is, is it is a truly, truly a results only work environment. We took all of the rules and we threw them away. We don't have office hours anymore. We don't have prescribed locations. Uh, we have a lot of our people that work from home. They work the graveyard shift. They work when they work. And the only requirement was we'll give you unlimited flexibility and freedom as long as you produce results. Now, that was easily said. I mean, you know, in theory, that works great. In practice, how do you do it? Well, we designed a system where everybody has an individual dashboard of results. And our view was, as long as you get your work done, if your client service scores are high, your 360 evaluations are good, your performance evaluations are good, and your financial stewardship is good. Do whatever you want, we don't care. And of course, my partner said, Brent, we'll go off a cliff. The day after you announce this, nobody will show up for work. And if nobody shows up for work, there'll be no billable savings. And if there's no billable savings, there'll be no revenue, and we'll be done. And I must confess, I thought that might happen. I really did. I thought, it's going to be like, a, like Ross Perot when he ran for president and he talked about that giant sucking sound. That was going to be the elevator uh, the day after we announced this when everybody left. Because if they were going to be paid, they didn't have to come to work. Why would you come to work? Well, we did that. And you know, a funny thing happened. In the first full year that we did it, we won more awards as a company than the entire preceding history of our company. Now, we didn't win the Great Places to Work Award, because <laughs> that's tough. 
But hey, we were number one in Illinois like in no time flat. And we got to number 14 in Texas without too much work. But the point is, our people embraced it. And you know another interesting thing that happened? As we put this in place, and as everybody started migrating to this new culture, to this new paradigm, guess what happened? Anybody know about the Great Recession? Imagine me trying to pilot the ship through this radical change right at the same time that the bottom starts falling out of the economy. Let's face it. We steered through the worst economic time in my life in our generation. And you know what happened? As a result of the changes we made, in 2009 we posted a record profit on record revenue. And we did it again in 2010. We saw our turnover go from 17% voluntary, it was 23 total, to 9%. I mean, do you know how much money that saves us in training and recruiting and what it means for client service? Look at what happened. When we started this process, we were at $74 million in revenue. By 2011, we were at $233 million in revenue, and I'm happy to report that on a pro forma basis for 2012, we're close to $400 million in revenue. Client satisfaction. Did you know that when you unleash people, and many of you probably know this, I certainly did not. But when you unleash people, when you give them the responsibility for results, when you let them hold themselves accountable, you know what? They'll hold themselves to a higher standard than you did. And we saw this. We saw satisfaction scores, and these are tallied up by third parties uh, based on direct client responses. We went from 92%, which was extraordinarily good in our industry, to 97% last year. Now we're at 85% when it comes to management recognizes honest mistakes in part of, as our, in part of our business. 82%. Management involves people and decisions that affect their jobs and their work environment. This is a psychologically healthy place to work. You saw those scores earlier. People are encouraged to balance their work and personal life. 90%. Who would have thought that possible? Managers avoid playing favorites, so we've got some still to work on. People look forward to coming to work here. A dramatic change. This is a fun place to work. And here's another area where we're still using the data and we still have some work to do. I feel good about the way we contribute to the community, 94%. This was one of the highest scores on any firm in the Great Places to Work list, and we're very, very proud of that. I want to work here for a long time. 87%. Taking everything into account, I'd say this is a great place to work, 92%. I mean, that is a huge, dramatic change from where we started. Um, we did it through innovation, persistence. This was hard. You know, every time I got the list, the letter from you guys saying, no, you didn't make it again this year, it just made us mad and we tried harder. It's, it's, it, it takes time to do this. You know, my, one of my recommendations is when you think about making this kind of a culture change, you've really got to get IT involved. You've got to get HR involved. You know, it's interesting that our po post-World War II legal structure has gone from a shield to a sword. And what I mean by that is, if you took a vote among our people today to scrap the federal wage and hour law, they would vote to scrap it because it's in the way of flexibility, it's in the way of doing their best work, uh, it's a big administrative hassle. And we're hopeful that the Congress will look at some point and change that because it isn't getting in the way of being a great place to work. Uh, we put the committees together and we do this incessantly. We apply for a lot of different awards and we win most of them and we take the information we get from those surveys back and we plow it into making the place better. Because one thing that you all know here, this is never done. This is, you, you never get to a point where you say, I'm done, I've arrived. Uh, you know, you saw the presentation earlier today because here I am, Brent, trying to get on the list, and every year you guys keep raising the bar. And I'm like, that's not fair. 
You know, because based on last year's results, I'd be there. But then, you know, it's higher. So uh, it's hard. You've got to continuously improve. Uh, and here's our big challenge. We announced about four weeks ago that we're acquiring our largest competitor uh, in the property tax space. So we'll be onboarding um, 625 people. Uh, we'll be a firm of uh, almost 1,700 before this uh, process is done. Uh, and you know, one of the real concerns that I have is, you know, are we going to be able to continue to uh, stay on this list? And of course, we won't be on this list. This is our one time. So if we hadn't made it this time, we'd have been out of luck because next year with, you know, 1,600 plus people, we'll qualify for the other list. And I was really excited to learn that it's easier to get on that big list than it is this little list. <laughs> if I'd have known that, I'd have bought a couple hundred employees years ago <laughs> and solved that problem. Um, let me tell you, here's the takeaway. I've got just a few minutes, and I want to share probably the most important thing that I've learned in this process. And that is, um, when you treat your people like they're your best clients, you win. When you let them drive, you win. When you design a culture that builds on itself. I call it the Ryan DNA. Because today, if people aren't doing their jobs, I don't have to do anything about it. The teams take charge of it. They will literally, like, a, like an antibody, they will attack people that are not doing what they're supposed to do, and they'll make it uncomfortable for them. They'll realize they're not performing. But I went from a guy that thought this list was nothing more than a contest for the trophy case. And from that humble beginning, I have realized that being a great place to work is the single most successful business strategy that exists. And our firm believes that we're going to take what we've learned, and we've learned a lot, and we're going to keep working to do better, and we're going to use this as the foundation to build a global brand, a billion dollar global brand in tax. And ladies and gentlemen, I know, after what I've seen today, after the process I've gone through these past eight years, that that would not have been possible had we not had this realization. We just simply couldn't have done it. So, for those of you that are still trying to get on the list, don't give up. The value that you'll harvest from it is well worth it. Uh, and frankly, for those of you that are on the list like us, um, we're going to keep getting better. We're going to keep raising the bar. Um, you know, this isn't about pizza on Friday. It's not about individual benefits. It's not about any of these things. It's the cumulative effect of being a great place to work that equals total employee engagement that will equal the highest productivity and the highest profitability that you can achieve as a company. I believe it because I've lived it. Thank you very much. Now, Sarah, I see that we've got two or three minutes. Well, you have to I'll... a short video, I think. Oh, that's right. Let, you, 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 know what? you know what? One of the things I did want to share with you is I'm most proud of what we've done in our community outreach area. And I want to share this video with you. This would not have happened without the Great Places to Work competition and what we learned from that process. We look at this particular community, and just a few years ago, we were somewhat afraid to come into the community because of the drugs and crime and prostitution. We've got blight. We've got areas that dramatically need to be rehabilitated. Yeah, we've been uh, knocking a lot of homes down. We're going to have our 250th home that we're going to knock down here this next month. But it's not about knocking things down, it's about building things up.
Several years ago, I was invited to be part of Dream Dallas, which is essentially, in my view, the habitat for humanity of Dallas on steroids, because what our goal is, is to raise $100 million to really impact neighborhoods across the southern sector in South Dallas. And what we're trying to do is to shore up the gap between the north part of our city and the south part of our city. We came up with a way to create a combination of opportunity between UNT Dallas, which is just down the street, and Habitat's Dream Dallas program. And that's what you see behind me. It's our community engagement and education program. We're planting a seed that will be an outreach for UNT Dallas. Uh, the University of North Texas at Dallas is a brand new university. We're two years old. And we will be actually running this uh, community engagement and education program through this beautiful house that you see behind me. Students will live in the upper floors of the house, and it will be an outreach. It's an outpost to the community. Some of the activities that they'll do will be things like uh, setting up community watch or a neighborhood watch, tutoring for neighborhood children. Uh, we hope to work a lot with the community people so that they realize this is their house. So our hope is that it will really bring this community closer and tighter to UNT Dallas. It's just paying attention. It's like watering a plant having a seed and watering it and you grow beautiful things and that's South Dallas is gorgeous and we need to help the people in South Dallas have access to education and public services and things like that. I want to say that we're very grateful to Brent Ryan for his generosity and to have the forethought to think about something as novel as a university getting involved with the development of the neighborhood. Uh, Brent Ryan sits on our advisory council, so he lends guidance, leadership, wisdom, and a checkbook in order for us to realize <laughs> that $100 million investment. It gives me goosebumps. I have goosebumps, and I, I'm just so grateful for, for that vision. We love Ryan Volunteers. Let me tell you, not only are they resilient through the summer heat, they are resourceful. They just, I, 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 can't, I can't say enough about Ryan. The vibe around the office is actually nervous. People have been pretty excited about it. There's been a lot of elevator talk since we work on multiple levels. And I think the Habitat folks think we might be the prettiest group they've ever seen. We have logo tents, ice chests, fans, but it's been really impressive and exciting to see the response of our employees to get out of the air conditioning in the fluorescent lights to come out here and make a difference in this community. You talk about sweat equity. We put in some sweat equity here and I'm really, really proud of all of them. Well, just to see the eyesores being torn down and new homes for families coming in, that's going to make a difference in this neighborhood. So there's no excuse, but there's opportunity. When you take away the excuses and provide the opportunity, then you come with growth. And this is not the ending, this is just the beginning. We've talked about the needs for stronger neighborhoods. And here in Oak Cliff Gardens, we want this to be a strong neighborhood. The power of education is transformational, and this, I hope, is a foundation for that in this community. It is the opportunity to unleash true greatness, economic opportunity in this neighborhood, and truly transform it. We won't, we won't do it uh, with just a house. Uh, we won't do it with just a university. And we won't do it just with the city's support. But with everybody working together, we will do it. And you don't know and this, but my this cousin is a small business owner in Oak Cliff. And, just and so I've ago, heard about these programs, we not from you, although we've front. seen it in your submissions, but from her. And it truly is an area that needs the support. So thank you for that. I'd like to just take maybe two questions. Um, we have about that much time. So uh, if somebody has, raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, it's the cookie eaters. They've just dropped off on that sugar. Here we go. <laughs> So I was just curious, I'm assuming as a services firm, you guys are billing hourlies? 
you, you know, we have about half of our business is built on a fee basis, and the other half is built on a success basis. Hmm. Okay, so did you guys have any issues with that when you switched to this model and came away from, did you have people either stop entering hours or questioning, hey, are you really watching my hours because you had to still record hours because that's your business? Well, we, we still do record billable time. So if it's required for a client, uh, that time is still recorded. We're moving away from the model where we used to track all time. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, you know, most people started ignoring those uh, requirements anyway because frankly, they didn't go anywhere. Um, what we want to record is the time that, that has to be billed, uh, and we want to record the time related to clients, but other than that, we don't, we don't use it. In the beginning, that's where we started. We passed out raises based on how many hours you put in. Right. So if you had a lot of hours, you got a bigger raise, and what we found out is that a lot of people were putting in time, but it wasn't effective. They were doing a great job of surfing the Internet, but their client's service scores weren't that good. Right. Thank you. So my question is, what other organizations have been inspired by your example? You know, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I can answer that directly, but here's one st statistic that um, shocks me even to this day. And that is, as one of the most successful tax professionals in the country, I receive far more requests to talk about workplace flexibility and work culture than I do tax matters. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what that says about my tax ability. <laughs> um, but I do think there are a lot of, of companies that are looking at this, that are inspired by it, that recognize that if you can unleash the productivity of your people, you can absolutely improve your performance. And, and we've seen that. All right. One more. Last one. Now, in, in listening to this, it sounds like a great sort of straight line. I have a feeling there were some hiccups and attempts to backslide during the way. What were some of the biggest challenges that made you question whether you were doing the right things, and how did you kind of power through that? Well, you know, um, successful people oftentimes have a way of projecting that success as if it were linear and if it were smooth. Um, you know, frankly, I, I must confess that if it were not for Delta Emerson and our HR team at the time, I probably would have given up on this because, frankly, after two or three or four years of being turned down and told, you know, your baby's ugly, it gets old, okay? It really does. I, I don't like it, and, you know, it didn't feel good. And I told you that part about my personality where I hate to lose, and it just made me matter and matter and matter. We were, from 2005 to 2008, 2007, we were on an uptick. And then uh, we, in, we acquired a number of firms in 2007, at the end of 2006, started integrating them in 2007. And you know what happened? Numbers came right back down. Uh, as we go through this, this upcoming acquisition, we're laser focused on the fact that we've got to handle it right. Because the risk for us is that we can take another dip. And we, don't, we want to avoid that. But it was not smooth. We'd make gains in some areas and we'd fall back in others. And then we'd, you know, but after 2008, when we ripped out the work culture, we got rid of the work rules, it's been on a steady increase. You know, and, and I would have never guessed it. I mean, I would have never guessed that you could improve productivity, you could improve satisfaction, you could reduce turnover by simply saying, guys, go do your best work and we're going to get out of the way. But that's exactly what happened. On that note, thank you very thank much. Thank you all very much. Small gift for you. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. Very much. All right, everyone. It is almost time to have some cocktails, so that's exciting. Um, in your packets that you received earlier, you've got this little lovely brochure. On the very back down here, you can see the QR code. We're high tech here at Great Place to Work, believe it or not. And um, that's where we're getting your feedback from. So please, if you have the opportunity, you can follow this link. And I believe the link itself is, yeah, the link is written as well in case you're old school and you actually type in addresses still. Uh, so you can do that as well. So we won't have you fill out some boring papers here today. Um, Want to just quickly ask a few people any ahas that you took away? Or was there a best practice that you're like, I can't wait to get home to tell everybody at work about this. You're going to stop in the hotel room and type it in five minutes because you're just busting to share. What was your big aha or takeaway, or just simply inspiration? Even that's exciting as well. Valentine's Day, yeah. So the folks that weren't at the panel, there was a story about um, 
uh, saving Valentine's Day for the men at their company by going out and buying roses and candy and setting it all out there so that they could take it out the door and be heroes when they got home. So that was a really quick and easy, fun thing to go do. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Don't question it. Just do it. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Well, I'll tell you that I'm going to do uh, take back the, what was it, $200 per person as uh, money for community donations instead of the, the arduous figuring out how to do a matching program. In small business, that's a lot of work to get a matching program going. So instead, $200 grant that they get to give and they get to try to build the money first so there's all this activity that goes around it and teams can compete and then a big donation day. I thought that sounded really fun. So I'll probably take that one back to the office. All right, well, uh, without further ado, thank you so much for coming. Without you here sharing with each other and the sharing isn't over, so please do continue. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. We couldn't have great workplaces and the impact that we try to have in the world without all of you being on the receiving end making it happen. So thank you to you. Have a good day. Safe travels. Your schedule for the rest of the evening is up here.